The first reading is from Jonah, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. And this can be found on page 928 of the Pew Bible. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The second reading is from Mark chapter 1 beginning at verse 9. And this can be found on page 1002 of the Pew Bibles. At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with wild animals, and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the word of the Lord. God. Just keep that wee verse up and we'll just pray into that, Lord God. As we sing, we remember that every day we have on earth is given to us by you. You are the king of our lives. So Lord, help us acknowledge you as king. Help us give our lives our all to love and follow you. Lord, Holy Spirit, be at work in each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> Wonderful lyrics in that hymn and many of the hymns uh, that we go through. And when we read them and we sing, uh, thinking about what we're reading, they say it is praying twice. Uh, we offer these wonderful uh, words up to God in prayer and praise. So we continue through Jonah. This is our fourth sermon. We're into chapter three. And I think uh, the next uh, Sunday after all age will finish us off. Uh, so we're into chapter three at this point. And the first thing we notice, notice about this chapter that Nigel read for us in chapter one is we see a similar situation, don't we? Uh, God inviting Jonah to do something, but we see an alternative Response. This is in chapter 1, verse 1. The Lord, where the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah, naughty Jonah, ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. 
at the start of chapter 3, which we've just read, after the boat, after the storm, after the fish, we have an identical command from God, nearly identical, uh, but as expected, a very different response from Jonah, given what he's been through, all the drama, his humbling, his repentance, his redemption. Jonah has a, a different response. Verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it a message I give you. And then verse 3, Jonah this time. Obedience. Instead of disobedience, obedience. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Let's just take a wee moment to think about that as we begin. Uh, we have a mirroring here. Uh, and it ties in, don't we, to what we have learnt over the last three chapters, what we've seen happen to Jonah. The call to Jonah from God, and then this blatant disobedience, and then God carries Jonah through this dramatic, um, practical lesson, life lesson on God's sovereignty, on his forgiveness, and his mercy for others. And so Jonah is humbled. We have a humbled and a repentant Jonah at this point, and he becomes an obedient follower follower and then maybe we would think well God Jonah we could leave it at that couldn't we disobedience lesson learnt obedience you'll not do that again will you Jonah no of course not God is that not where we leave it but no it doesn't end there Jonah might it seems know he himself is a saved person he has been saved by the God of salvation but does that mercy does that love of God extend to others for Jonah? We'll have a wee look at that. Just now, just think about the idea of the difference between these two states in Jonah, between obedience of God and disobedience of God. We'll look at that for a wee second as we begin. I don't think for a second that our disobedience or our obedience of God will ever in a million years look anything like Jonah's experience. I don't think that any of us will be brought through a redemption story like Jonah's in these first three chapters. But what we should see, what we should notice, is that as followers of Jesus, if we are committed followers, committed to following him in this life, believing in him for real, following him for real, then that will bring about the work of the Holy Spirit in us. Which in a way will be like a request to follow God's command like Jonah had and in response we will have an option like Jonah to obey or to run and the journey that's before us on our Christian walk well we will be asked to walk in God's steps in his will and we will always have that choice we have that choice daily yeah, I'd rather not or to go okay I will for the repentant believer, the Holy Spirit, with the help of God's word, is there to guide us, to help us journey in God's will, to keep us on the right path. You all know this verse, your word is a lamp to my feet, a light on my path. God's word is God's voice coming to us, instructing us, guiding us. And that will guide us in our lives on his path. Every one of us will have a different set of challenges, a different way in which we will need to trust in God given what we face. But that's what we're asked to do. Through the Holy Spirit we're prompted to know what God's commands are for us, His path for us, and we either choose to follow or we run in the opposite direction. That choice is always there for us, always will be there for us every day of our lives. The journey of the Christian is following God's will in our lives, learning his will for us through his word, through prayer, and seeking to follow that. That's where every day we have opportunities like Jonah to scarper. Jonah here at this moment is sure, he is reminded that it is better to be in God's will rather than against God's will. If you are a believer, if you have journeyed with God, if you are doing life with God, then you will know that feeling. That feeling when you're doing something that you know is outside of his will and there's an uneasiness with it. 
And at the same time, you will know a peace. You can get nowhere else when you know you're in God's will and you're doing what he wants for you. Holy Spirit guides us. And we grow and we mature as Christians as we seek to look to his word and follow him. Anyway, this is life for Jonah now. A life of obedience, you would think. Jonah obeyed God. Verse 3. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was in a very important city. A visit required three days. It's a bit strange. A bit uh, important city equals three days. What does that mean? Well, it's actually less about size. Uh, this three days, Mark, it's not about the... Uh, like that's how long it took to get across it. It's more about the importance, the size of the city in terms of its importance. It's more about procedure, this. If an important visitor in these times arrives in an important city to give an important message, somebody like a diplomat, or like a prophet, or like a messenger, then the three days were required. One, for them to settle in. Two, for them to deliver the message. And the third day, for them to be responded to, that message to be responded to by the locals. So this was an important city. You don't just rush in, blur out the message and rush out again. A day to settle, a day to share, a day to receive. And so Jonah proclaims then what God told him to say. Forty more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Like any preacher, like any order they are open to people asking them questions and that would have been different you know it is while they thought that, that Jonah the prophet the preacher will not have just said these words and then Scarbert it is probable that he would have gave, gave the people more context would have said well what do you mean by that and Jonah will have explained I'm sure that this is his God the God of the Hebrew God and this is his will. And it's because of your actions, because of what you've done. He would remind them of God's nature. And the bottom line is, whatever they heard that Jonah had said, they were convicted. Sorry, verse 5. They were convicted as a nation, heavily convicted en masse, it seems. Verse 5, the Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. They heard the word of God, and they believed. That is the work of the Spirit. The Spirit of God that's in us, and identifies God's word when we hear. That's why the verse that uh, Jillian put up for us. We read that, and we're either convicted to believe it, or we're not. The Holy Spirit identifies that scripture as truth in us. And then we are impacted. The Ninevites believe God. They believe what Jonah was saying. How could a whole nation be such convicted in one go? How can that happen? It seems like an unrealistic thing. Another thing in Jonah that raises our eyebrows. A whole city repented Here's one way to look at it. There is evidence around this time in the 700s BC that, uh, and this was known as one of the largest cities in the world at that point, that this area had experienced major earthquakes <coughs> under King Ashurdan's rule of Assyria in 1760, which is during the time of Jonah and King Jeroboam II in Israel. For years also, leading up to 759 BC, there were lots of famines and plagues, we're told. And also astronomers have worked out that in 763 BC, there will have been a total eclipse of the sun. So that the light of the sun was blocked out at a certain moment in time. Why am I saying all this? Well, these are superstitious people and superstitious generations like all of the ancient world. And with folk like this experience extreme conditions like famines, like plagues, like earthquakes, like strange signs, they knew it was nothing to do with their king and their army. They knew it was nothing to do with the, the enemies outside them. They knew it was from somewhere else and they worried and they went to things, 
gods outside of their control. They would assign these events to angry gods and gods were not pleased with them. They'd be very superstitious. And you remember the mariners, the boat, uh, what's the people called? Sailors. 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 <laughs> you remember the sailors on the boat? Uh, the pagan sailors. They, uh, they were superstitious too. Whenever the the storm came, they were, they were looking around. Or who's to blame for this? Who has done what wrong? What God has been offended to bring all this? These are a superstitious people. Without, if they're not the Israelite people, then they don't have the rule of one God over them. They have all these superstitions and they're interwoven. That's why this pagan world would have gods of the harvest, gods of fertility, and all these things that they feared that were outside their control. So a nation in the midst of fa- famines and, uh, and plagues and earthquakes and dark signs would be ready, would have been ready to be on the lookout for an answer to all this devastation. What have we done wrong? Why are the gods against us? And all night was pagan sailors in their storm. They're going, why? What is going on? And now, of course, the Ninevites get this answer from the prophet of a Hebrew God, risking his life, preaching in the center of an enemy city. That will have not gone unnoticed with them too. And they were moved as a people to repentance. Possibly the disasters which Nineveh were facing may have moved them as a nation to be ready for repentance. Who knows? the very least, the work of the Holy Spirit was an action. I remember hearing about New York, and maybe shared this already during the time of uh, just before and after the Twin Towers fell. Uh, the artist community in New York, which was a, a key one, a thriving one, they noticed that uh, once they held an art exhibition just after the 9-11 disaster, the first exhibition they had after they noticed a big massive change in all the art that was produced. They noticed that before the towers fell, if there was an art exhibition in New York, it was always paintings of, of, of dark themes, of negative things, of death and destruction and decay. But after the towers came down, the first art exhibition, all the local artists, they were painting all these landscapes, flowers, paintings of hope, paintings of joy and beauty. Almost as if the whole people, because of that one disastrous event, were turned to good in some way. Wanted to express something of goodness, something of God in their artistry. Major things can happen like disasters, two major areas, and everyone can be impacted. Everyone can develop a sorrow. Even events can humble a whole nation. So was that what happened here? The Assyrians were so convinced that they all repented, verse 5, from the greatest to the least of them. And even the king Verse 6, when the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Any nation, any, any leader of any nation, you would expect a leader to be the one to be the most concerned about how things are going in that country, in that nation. And you wouldn't be surprised if this conviction, this natural conviction that came to the people came also to the king who is the leader and the one to look to. These are very symbolic acts, especially for a king. His throne, his robe were important. These are very public signs, public signs of repentance and humility before God. These are sort of almost the, the most extreme signs that the king could do to show something. Getting off his throne, basically getting off the seat of his nation and sitting in a pile of ashes instead. Swaps the seat of high power for a seat of desolation and ruin. Takes off his royal robes, which would 
always have been the most luxurious, most fine material, uh, most comfortable material, plush, and then they wear sackcloth, coarsest, the most uncomfortable material made of black goat's hair, whatever. So you can see how a nation would really, as a whole, repent, especially when the message comes down from the king and his nobles, and he hammers at home. He orders a decree that every man or beast, even their animals in the field, fasted and be covered with sackcloth and ashes. A mighty order, a mighty gesture from a king and all the people. And the king then says, Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And we talked about last last week. Even though he knows he's guilty and he deserves what for from this God, he repents, which is right, and then he hopes. Maybe God and his compassion will relent. And good news. Good news for the king, good news for Nineveh. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. This does not mean that God made a mistake and then changed his mind, realizing that he was wrong in any way. God was right to condemn Nineveh for the wrong that came up against him, but he's also right in his character in his nature to forgive those who repent. This is the wonderful good news of the God that we have. We have a God who relents, who has compassion, who forgives. It could have been like these sailors or these Ninevites that we just had a God who didn't bother with all that. He dissed out the punishment we deserved. But my goodness, good news, we have a God who relents. Doesn't mean he changes his mind. It means or he got it wrong about us in the first place. It means, that we have, it means that we have the opportunity to follow him or to not. That is the choice that every person in every pew in this church has as an individual. You have a choice to follow the Lord God or not. You have an opportunity to follow him or not. It's totally nothing to do with me. It's about you as a person. You have a choice to be redeemed or to be lost. And the wonderful good news is we have a God who relents and who forgives. God gave Saul, remember we went through First Samuel, God gave Saul the opportunity to be king of Israel. Saul took it. But then he eventually chose to do things his own way, to take his own path, <coughs> do what was right in his own mind, not follow God what he wished. And then God anointed David instead. He regretted his choice, Scripture tells us, but that doesn't mean he did the wrong thing. He gave the guy an opportunity, like he gives every one of us. And depending on what we do, he will relent or not. Jonah thought the Ninevites were far too bad, far too far gone to receive any such mercy, good news, relenting. Our God, however, is in the business of forgiveness and that is the greatest news for every single one of us. In Jeremiah 18, where God talks about, I am the potter, you are the clay, verses 7 and 8 say, If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom, that I will pluck it up and break down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I intended to do it. God is in the business of responding to us. And he does it with compassion. And he loves us and he relents. Jesus is the personification of this very wonderful attribute of God. He is all that in a nutshell for us. We don't have to be thrown into the sea, swallowed by a fish, or any of that. God has made it so clear to us. 
He has stepped into history and to a point in time so that everyone will know his name and know what this offer is. Something to be celebrating that we have a God who is in this business. Jonah didn't seem to like the idea that God was in this business for other people, for others, for the Ninevites. He seemed to have learned his lesson, but he didn't want it for them. The Pharisees, you'll remember, didn't seem to like the idea that God was in the business of compassion, relenting of his wrath. Jesus coming alongside the prostitute, the tax collector, the sinner. That was a true offence to them. But Jesus is about forgiveness. Jesus' message in Mark, which Nigel read for us. The time has come, Jesus says. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the good news. We have a God who is compassionate. Full of second chances, as Jillian put it. And that is wonderful good news. People, please see it. God wishes to give you the opportunity to know his compassion, his forgiveness, his mercy. But you must realize and take that opportunity for yourself in this life that you've been given. We're also to celebrate that opportunity. That that opportunity is there and available for others no matter what we think of it. Psalm 130, a beautiful verse. If you, O Lord, kept the record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet, Lord, the next line, but with you there is forgiveness. Let's pray. Lord, we want to thank you that you are in the business of forgiveness, in the business of relenting. That is nothing but good news. You show that mercy and forgiveness to those who deserve punishment, but instead, if they've gone to you in repentance for forgiveness, you, you relent. Lord, help us realize this in our lives. Help us recognize the wonderful good news that is available to all of us who trust in Jesus. And of course, Lord, help us never assume anyone else is beyond this wonderful forgiveness. May we not take pleasure in condemning others, but instead have full awareness of our own fallenness and seek to share your forgiveness with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.